Hello, 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 hello. I'm going to discuss with you the solution to what I call the re-entry problem. There's an aluminum satellite 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface in circular orbit. It has a mass of 5,000 kilograms and the temperature of the satellite is 10 degrees centigrade. It re-enters because of air drag. And the first question is, what is the difference in energy, in joules, between the satellite in orbit and between the satellite on the ground with zero speed? And you will see that as the satellite re-entered, that the energy in orbit is larger than the energy on the ground. And thus, that difference is going to be released. And that's the first thing I want you to calculate with three digit precision. So, what we need is the mass of the Earth. We need the mass of the satellite, which is 5,000 kilograms. We need the radius of the Earth. There is a 0.3% difference between the equator and the poles. That's so, the difference is so small. So I've rounded that off. We took the average value. We need the gravitational constant. The orbit of the satellite is at distance little r from the center of the Earth. And the radius of the Earth is r Earth. This little plus sign indicates Earth. And so this radius is the radius of the Earth plus the 100 kilometers. So many meters. Potential energy when the object is at rest on the surface of the Earth. You may have to redo your homework on that. It's all very well covered in my A01 lectures. It's negative because we define the potential energy zero at infinity. That's the only meaningful way to define it. And so the closer you are to the Earth, the more negative the number is. But it means that if you go away from the Earth, you always have to do positive energy to get further away. Think about that. So, it's then minus little m mass Earth g divided by the radius, and that is so many joules. 3.1 3 to 10 to the 11 joules. Now the total energy of an object in circular orbit, I also discussed that in great detail in my lectures, is of course the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. But the kinetic energy, listen carefully, the potential, potential the kinetic energy, which is of course positive, potential energy is negative, the potential energy is minus half the potential energy. Since it's minus, the kinetic energy becomes positive. And so, when you add the two up, you get that the, to the total energy, kinetic energy plus potential energy, in orbit with radius little r, is then the potential energy at orbit r divided by 2. And that's a negative number. But this number is larger than that number. And so energy is released. And this is how much energy is released. 1.59 times 10 to the 11 joules is released. Let's now calculate how much energy is needed to evaporate the 5,000 kilograms of aluminum. And 
it's really not possible, I think, to do that with three digit precision. What you need is the specific heat for aluminum. Most books that I have consulted claim 900 joules per kilogram per degree Kelvin. So that's perhaps a reliable number. And we are going to increase the temperature from 10 degrees centigrade to 660 because it starts to melt at 660 degrees centigrade. And 1 degree centigrade is the same as 1 degree Kelvin in terms of the difference. So we are increasing the temperature by 650 degrees Kelvin. So the energy that it takes to go from 10 degrees centigrade to 660 is the 5000 times the 650 times 900. Here's the result. If I look up the energy per kilogram to melt aluminum, uh, the numbers can vary a few percent. And so that already means you can get three digit precision. I have chosen 3.9 times 10 to the 5 joules per kilogram. Some books tell you 4.00, close enough as far as I'm concerned. So, to melt 5,000 kilograms will then be 3.9 times 10 to the 5th times the 5,000. And here is the result. Now comes the blocker, so to speak. If you try to find how much energy it takes to evaporate one kilogram of aluminum, I found values in the literature which varied as much as 10%. So, I picked one that I found in two books and I also found it on the web, but I want to stress that there were other places where it differed by about 10%. So that number is roughly 1.1 times 10 to the 7 joules per kilogram. Certainly no better than two digits with precision. You certainly cannot trust that number any better. So to evaporate it then is 5,000 times 1.1 times 10 to the 7th, and that gives you this number. And if we add them all three up, then it's about 6.0 times 10 to the 10 joules to evaporate the 5,000 kilogram, which started off at 10 degrees centigrade. If you call it 6 times 10 to the 10th, we'll still be friends. It would be only one digit precision. If we make the very unrealistic assumption that it's only a Gedanken experiment, something we do in our heads, if we make the unrealistic assumption that all that energy that is released is absorbed in the form of heat into the satellite, then indeed that number is larger than this number, and therefore, yes the satellite will not even reach the ground, it will be totally evaporated before it hits the surface of the Earth. Uh, on a separate issue, you may want to ask yourself the question, would that conclusion change if you made the mass much higher of the satellite or much lower? And the answer is, no, it would not change if you apply that same unrealistic assumption that all the energy that is released comes out in the form of heat and is absorbed by the satellite, you will come to the same conclusion that there is enough energy to evaporate it. And the reason for that, that every term that I have in here is proportional with little m. It's proportional to little m when we calculate this number and it is proportional to little m when we calculate this number, when we calculate this number, and when we calculate this number. So this is also proportional to little m. So you can change m, little m, any way you want to, and you will always have to come to the conclusion that there is plenty of energy to evaporate the entire satellite. But in reality, of course, 
in many cases that will not happen because not all the energy that is released is going to be absorbed by the satellite as heat. Okay, I thought it was an interesting problem. Yeah, I like the idea since it covers two completely different parts of physics. Let's try to be friends again. It would be easy for me. Have a nice day and take care. Halfway down the solutions, when I say, now listen carefully. <laughs> and what I then said, there was one slip of the tongue. You probably hardly noticed it, but I really want to be sure that you got it because I say, now listen carefully. So, in the case of a circular orbit, the kinetic energy is minus one half the potential energy. I repeat, in the case of a circular orbit, the kinetic energy is minus one half the potential energy. And therefore, when you add up the potential energy and the kinetic energy in a circular orbit, you'll find that the sum is the potential energy at that orbit divided by two. <laughs> okay? So, <laughs> I really didn't want to have to redo the video. I thought that this was probably, this correction was probably enough, but you may not even have noticed the slip. <laughs> One more point I want to make. So I state that if all the energy that is released in the form of heat absorbed by the satellite, then the satellite will evaporate before it hits the ground. Some smart people will say, well, suppose the kinetic energy that is destroyed when it hits the ground plays a major role because that's part of the heat, of course, that is released part of the energy that is released. And so, if that played a major role, major role, it could still reach the Earth, and then, because of the heat released at the surface, it would evaporate. However, the satellite, as it re-enters, will reach terminal velocity at a very high density, of the Earth's atmosphere when it gets close to the Earth. And even if you make the assumption that the object, which will then reach a terminal velocity in the Earth's atmosphere, even if it had a speed of a few hundred kilometers per hour, and it probably will not go any faster, then you will see that that kinetic energy, when it hits the ground, is so small that it will not play a major role to help the satellite evaporate. And so the conclusion is then still correct that there is then always enough energy in that unreasonable assumption to evaporate the satellite before it hits the Earth. So I wanted to add this because clearly if the kinetic energy that is destroyed in the last split second when it hits the Earth, if that played a major role, then my statement that it may evaporate before it reaches the surface would then not be correct. So that's why I thought, for those of you who are very smart, to make sure that you understand I did not overlook that. <laughs>